Okay. Yeah, we're good now. All right. Um, I'll say a quick prayer so we can go ahead and get started so we aren't up till super late. <laughs> okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this day. We're grateful for all that thou hast given us and for this opportunity that we have to increase our education. We ask thee to please guide us that we may be able to learn and to do our best. And we ask thee for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Um, any spiritual message of the week? Um, I'm taking foundation for restoration and mm -hmm. we're going over just kind of like um, the atonement and and the fall of Adam and stuff and it just kind of makes you like I, don't know. I mean it's a short message but I'm just like kind of grateful for the atonement the fact that we can do that uh, Jesus atoned for sins to make up for the fall of Adam and so yeah yeah True. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Um, so this week's case, Andreessen, I don't know how you say his name, Andreessen and Horowitz. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting names. Um, so I'm trying to, okay, found it. <coughs> So the group questions. Um, so the first one says, so far we have learned to evaluate business models of startups. Today we will, we will examine the business model decisions of a startup in a mature industry. As a group, begin by discussing the following questions. Was the VC industry attractive for A16Z to enter in 2009? What was the competition like? at that time at the time so for this one i, I put not really because <clears throat> it says only it was like what like only like about three percent of these had good returns um and then on yeah. top of that, in one of the exhibits let me see it showed that um vc companies are actually going down the number um in 1992 it said the number in existence 358 in 2002 it was 1,089, and then 2012 was 841. So it went yeah. up, well, but then it's starting to go down, and it's kind of talked about how you had incubators that are starting to pull people away, like Y Combinator, y Combinator and then you have low startup costs, so people don't really need um, like startup money, so they're not going to investors, or they go to private investors. Yeah. Another thing, like, I also agreed with you that it would, like, I mean, it's not an attractive time to enter into the market, especially because, like, the market crashed in 2008, um, yeah. and, like, a lot of businesses, like, were failing, and not as many people were starting businesses up, but it also said in the case that 40% of, like, venture-backed companies were failing at that time as well. So, like, if you invest in a company, like, you have a four out of ten chance that, like, that company is going to fail and you're going to lose money. Right. So, I mean, I thought that, like, that's a little bit nerve-wracking, at least to me. Like, I have a 40% chance of losing money on this. Like, it's kind of sketchy. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yes, I agree with it. They were having a very bad, I mean, very bad side about that specific market back then. So they they really needed to think about positioning the specific business they were thinking about not to lose their money. Because just with the perspective and having the percentages in market going down, that didn't sound like a very good idea. But in the end they were able in and taking the risk to start and enter into this industry anyhow. Yeah, and and, and also um and I, like I said, I don't know a ton about venture capitalism, but from what I know, it's usually started by successful people. When somebody goes out and starts a venture capitalist company, they, it's started by people who have seen success. So if 40%, you said 40% are successful, right? Or 40% fail? It was 40% fail, right? Yes. Um, so 40% of the companies that are backed by venture capitalists oh, okay. fail. 
Okay. Well, anyways, so a lot of these VC companies, they're not even successful in general. Um, and yeah, so well, you were saying like 3% are actually only making a decent profit, which I remember reading that too, and I'm like, whoa. Yeah, it's like three, 3 to 5%, somewhere around there. And, and if a VC is usually started by people who've had success in the past and only that many are successful, then it's kind of a tough industry to go into. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like a lot of them probably like break even or so, mm -hmm. um, but not very many were just like making that big, big dollar amounts that that three to five percent was making. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it could still be kind of attractive because I mean, you could still be making money and come or coming out about even, um, but unless you're like really good or one of the top big guys, you're not gonna get the big dollar amounts, bringing in tons and tons of um, companies that you're going to make money on that are going to grow. Yeah. Yes, because just only 20% of those companies inside that market were the ones producing a, a margin of high returns. So just imagine just 20% of lots of companies just making a high returns and that was their perspective to make that amount of money. Having this perspective was not something very trustable to go with at that time. Yeah. Yeah. So only twenty percent are making a good margin, and forty percent, uh, the other forty percent, are failing. So you've got like not yeah. a whole lot of percentage <laughs> on your side there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no bad. Um. So, I guess kind of the next question, I'm trying to find which one was it. Um, went over that. Um, with all the entrenched incumbents and catch-22s, what silver lining did A16Z see? Um, so, I think the biggest thing they saw what caught my attention was the most was how they said um, they did research on like internet, like they, um, Andreessen like came from um, his whatever his like um, Netscape, I think one of them came. From yeah, yeah, Netscape. He came from that, so he like he had a ton of background with like internet and technology, um, and like so he was familiar with that and realized that that industry was growing extremely rapidly so new people entering into that industry could still come out and make big money and it said somewhere that they kind of tapped into it and realized that a lot of these uh, other VCs weren't really investing in these guys because there were so many of them but because the industry was growing so rapidly it could support so many of these different IT businesses that were just starting out. And I think that's what they realized and that's why they became successful. Right, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yes, because actually they, they knew what they were looking for. They started with a good plan, doing a research first, evaluating the market, even though they knew the market was not very, very good rank at that time. But they, would, they were thinking about, I mean, looking with the, uh, what the needs were back then, so they were able to supply those needs. So pretty much that was what happened because they came up with new ideas, different instructions, different business models. That was the thing helping them to come yeah. up with a very good business model at the end and have a success, successful plan at the end. Yeah, exactly. From what I read, it sounded like when they started, they wanted to do the opposite of what a lot of these venture capitalists firms were doing. Um, because obviously, if only like three percent of them are successful, then they're probably not doing things right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think I don't remember exactly when this came on one of and one of the paragraphs that said like because they were quoted or they had they came out in the New York Times several times, or at least twice I think. So one of the times when there was an article posted in the, the New York Times about them, it said they were just becoming a hub for Silicon Valley startups. 
because a lot of those Silicon Valley startups were like these IT things and they were just like owning the market right there for these IT guys because they're, they, they, he built up a great team or a great, a great crew or I don't remember what they, the exact term they use in the reading or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but they had a, a really good set of people doing like the like marketing or researching or looking for those different business, the startup businesses and they just, right. they knew exactly what they were looking for. So I couldn't tell, were they, with the people that they brought on, were they all tech people? I think, yeah, I think all of them were like IT tech people that they were bringing on. And well, I think I read somewhere that they did bring on like a marketing guy or something. I can't remember. It was on like page mm. six or seven. Um, but I mean, they were very specific in who they were bringing on. I feel like. Right, and like one of their th- their their choices that they're trying to make right now is: do they go outside of technology? Do they invest in? Other yeah. Areas? And so my question was: well, if they're all tech guys, would that be a good idea? If it seems like they're totally owning the tech market, maybe they stay in tech for a little bit and then maybe invest in one or two businesses outside of that area. Uh, mm-hmm. Especially because like, I mean, obviously it's 2017 now and this was about 2013 and we know like the tech market is still growing like right. crazy rapid. Like, I mean, it's not slowing down anytime soon. So like, I honestly think like stay in the tech market and if you want to double your investments uh, and I'm not even sure about that, but like there's plenty, plenty of room oh, yeah. for investment. There's a lot of opportunity in, in tech. But one important thing they were thinking about because not not just they have a plan, but also they have a well and organized structure in, inside their company because right. they were looking for three specific things of people they were hiring. First of all, they said they needed candidates have been a founder, a CEO, or both. The second thing they were looking for to be effective at coaching technical founders. And the third requirement was they value our culture of teamwork. Mm-hmm. So below it says that the other busy, um, busy firms were looking just for marketing people, just for CEOs, but they were looking for anyone having those three attributes and committed to work and develop a better company. So that was the thing because I remember reading whenever they were having their meetings, if someone was arriving late, they right. needed to ten dollars per minute arriving late. So yeah. that their values were very strict. So that mm-hmm. was what they were making to to go beyond their outcomes. Right. Yeah, that, that's a good point there. Yeah. yeah. And I think like, uh, like it, it, I read one part where it says by December 2013, they had eight GP or they had employed eight yeah. um, general partners, 14 supporting investment professional, an operating team of 43 professionals, three special advisors, six board partners and 22 staff members in administrative role. So, I mean, they just had like a, a big crew really just like, mm-hmm hitting it full on like just with the train i don't know how else other to say it but um and obviously they were doing well enough to support everyone i mean the team that he built was really incredible actually yeah it was a big team yeah they knew what they wanted yeah I think that's what made them stand out against the competition is the fact that they were confident. It seemed like they were confident in the decisions that they were making. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- he also had, like, he did some talk with one of the, what it was called, like the CAA or something like that. Um, what was it? Yeah, the CAA, Creative Artist Agency, and one of like the founders of that was um, Michael Ovitz, and he was telling them or telling Andreessen that 
um, cold starts into like an in industry that's been a while for a while, a cold start, like a brand new start person like A16Z has a lot going against them, but it's also the best way to implement a radically new operating model. And that's exactly what they did. Different than these other VCs in, in the industry. And they took the advice head on from or Ovitz or so whatever his name is from CAA's founding partners, I guess. Yeah, and that almost kind of goes back to our first case where uh, Dr. John, the John guy, found what some of those other companies were missing, and he made the product like really like he kind of took all their weaknesses and made it his strength and built a company around that and was able to compete with like big companies. And I think that's what happened here is that these guys looked at the other venture venture capitalist firms and they asked, "What can we do better? What what are some of their weaknesses?" And we'll capitalize on that. Yeah. Yes, that's the outcome that we were able to get if we do a research first of what the other companies launching the same business are missing. So that way we came up and just supplied those needs. Mm -hmm. Because that way people will, will start looking for us instead of going with what they currently have. Because if we're offering something different, something which is friendly, something which is making them to get what they want, that's going to make the difference. Right. Yeah. Um, so the next one, um, why is, uh, why is the weirdest name? I, I can't even like say it right in my own head. Why is a one six Z or 16 Z specifically targeting first time technical co-founders? How has the coast of tech startups impacted the VC industry? Or the cost? Well, I said coast. I'm, I'm losing it. How has the cost of tech startups impacted the VC industry? Um, so this one, I think they're targeting I mean, from what I was reading, it, it appears that they were targeting first-time technical co-founders co is because um, they, like the, these founder, they, because the other VC um, companies out there would like tend to fire the CEO and then put in a, a put in a new CEO. Right. Um, but I think that's what, um, A16Z was doing a little bit different is that they were kind of trusting the founder to be the CEO and even doing like some kind of like training or something like I'm not exactly sure if it was really trainings um, but different advice to give them and stuff um, so I feel like that's why they're kind of targeting the founders because um, these founders they didn't want to go to these other VCs where they're going to be like okay, sorry, you're not doing a good enough job. We're going to replace you with this person. You can still be the founder, but this guy is going to be the CEO now. Um, so I don't think they really liked that. They, they liked that uh, A16Z trusted them to do their job. Because, I mean, they were looking, A16Z was looking at, like, Apple, Microsoft, do it, like all these other big IT companies that were run by the founders right from right. the beginning for a long time. Yeah, that, that's a really good point because most of those places, I mean, obviously the Apple, Steve Jobs died, but like it was when, when, when Apple first came out, they were successful and then they replaced Steve Jobs and then Apple started going downhill and then they bring Steve Jobs back and it goes back to being really good again. So I think keeping the original CEO is probably a good idea. Yeah. Yes, because they were identifying just the abilities and the skills uh, in people what they were hiring. Because whenever they were hiring someone, or whenever a specific department was hiring some people, they mentioned that that specific person was previously working and launching a different business and launching a different company, being successful in some other areas. So they were looking people already prepared. 
who already had some success to just come coming here with us team and just to do the same thing and some of the um, of the persons they were hiring or rehiring it's that because they were working with them in the very beginning when they were just a small group right um so the next part of like this section was how well has the cost of how has the cost of tech startups impacted the vc industry how has it impacted the need for technical co-founders to raise capital, do these trends apply to other sectors such as life sciences or clean tech? So when it's talking about the cost of tech startups, is it like um, how much is it costing your average person to start a business? Like, because I know in, in Yeah, I think it's like talking about how much they need to like how much funding they need from like a VC or from like their bank or something um to get themselves going right and it kind of mentioned from what i saw that one of their biggest concerns with venture capital capital firms is uh, a lot of the startup costs are dropping a little bit um for example a lot of people go into tech i think sometimes they do like e-commerce sites and those are like for like if you build your own website you don't need a web developer anymore like you have um Sites like Shopify and Wix and all those places where you can just start your own business online. So you don't need to get the web developer, you don't need to get the graphic designer, you don't need to get. So all you need is just money for creating whatever tech device I guess you're making. If that makes sense. That might just be. That might be more confusing. No, no, I think that totally makes sense. Um, and how has this impacted the need for technical? co-founders to raise capital um i'm not i'm having a hard time like really understanding that question um, um if i'm understanding it correctly are they saying like so the people who are investing are the tech guys um so when i when somebody comes when somebody with a startup comes to these guys they'll probably want somebody who's done tech before because they might need a little bit of help in general yeah and maybe that's yeah. what I'm, I'm kind of with you. The, the questions are a little ambiguous. Yeah. <laughs> um, impact of the need for technical co founders. I mean, obviously, they do have to raise capital, the, these co-founders. But yeah, like you were saying, obviously, all these IT companies are going to want someone who has had background and experience so that they can help them and understand Yeah, um, more. and raise capital at the same time. Yeah, they want a mentor and somebody that they can uh, open the door up to for networking and stuff. So yeah. maybe that's what it means, and that's why you want like. So if you're looking to invest in tech, obviously you're going to bring tech guys because they'll know people that they connect can connect these startups with. They can mentor them, and one of the big things is like helping them out, but not like holding their hand the whole way. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because they had a very organized plan, so that as they were not hiring just anybody who was not going to be able to be capable or already trained to develop the task that they got they were going to require from that specific person because as we discussed before they were very strict of what they were doing so that is why they needed someone capable tasks there they were then to and charge and that person right hmm. Um, and then do these trends apply to other sectors such as life sciences and clean tech? Um, I feel like those industries like cost for those startups might like it's not decreasing like um, the tech startups. Um, so I don't think it's apply I don't think it's like the same the same trends are applying to these different um, to this different sector of the industry or whatever. Um, so yeah. Um, 
what choices do technical founders have for financing that they didn't have a decade before? Mm. Well, they were mentioning about different firms they were working with. They were mentioning, I mean, investing in firms for millions of dollars, such as Facebook. Also, they were talking about Twitter, Google, all those type of things were just small things, and even some of those just projects of things to finance and invest on. So they, because, when again, in the market was very low back then, because the specific tools and firms they were financing in the future were not very strong. They didn't have a very high a margin of users and all of that. So that is why whenever they were starting investing in those was then uh, improving and just growing up. And I could mention these are the um, options they did have, they didn't have in the past. Yeah, that's true. So when it's asking, so with this question, technical founders, are they talking about the people who are doing startups and stuff? Are talking? Yeah, yeah, I think so. The, like the, yeah, just the different business owners that are just starting up new companies. Right, and, and nowadays you have crowdfunding. Um, yeah. But you could easily go into Kickstarter and start a campaign in like an hour instead of having to like network and figure out, oh, like, will this person know an investor that I can get in front of? Like, it's so much harder to get in front of a venture capitalist than it would be to just launch a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the next one, VC, there's a lot of questions on this time, on for the group, I feel like, this time. But yeah. VC firms compete on their ability to source, pick, and win. How does A16Z's business model influence these abilities compared to other VC firms? Well, I feel like for A16Z, like specifically, they were targeting IT startups that they felt like other VC firms had not realized that could have a lot of potential yet. Right. So like, they were targeting a specific market that other firms just hadn't realized could be really beneficial yet. Because right. there was so much IT going on at that time. So I feel like that, I mean, that was their business model right there was target targeting that and obviously that was a huge difference compared to other VC firms that kind of overlooked those guys. Plus the market things too. They held events yeah. and did things like that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Because they were mentioned in regards to this specific thing that when it refers to pick and win they needed to really pick the opportunity when they had the opportunity in front of them because if they just allow the opportunity to go away, they were gonna miss a lot, a lot of uh, a lot of income, revenue, and all, and all those things. And then they explained that win means a long process. They explained that win means to do everything they can to make that opportunity profitable because it has taken a margin of around 10 years to verify and start seeing just some returns. But most important part will be to pick the opportunity and then to do all we can to make that opportunity successful. Yeah, right. I agree. All right, moving on because I want to keep this going because <laughs> there's so many different questions. Yeah. We're getting closer to the end now. But think of source as the ability to get founders to come in the door seeking money. How does the way A16Z treat its founders differ from the way a traditional VC treats them. Will this increase, decrease, or have no effect on the number of potential deals A16Z sees compared to the comp to the competition? And like I, I kind of like we were kind of talking about that earlier already that um, they're treating the founders like CEOs, like they're saying, okay, yeah, may, you're going to be the CEO, but they're also offering them advice right. and. Um, not just overlooking their potential to run a business. And I right. feel like, like obviously, that's going to totally increase the number they get compared to their competition. Right. And uh, 
Yeah, we kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier that they they had the fee whenever their investor was late. They would, what was it, like ten dollars, a hundred dollars a minute, or ten dollars a minute. So like, mm -hmm. they, they wanted the people that they're investing in to know that they were serious about about it. Yeah. And like one thing that I'm yes, just noticing. Were... Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's kind of a little off topic, but not really. But one thing I'm just noticing from like all these successful guys that are starting up businesses is that like they're seriously doing their research. Like the ones yeah. that are successful, like it, like it says over and over again that they went and talked to people, they asked questions, right. they, they went and did this, like looked up information on their own. Um, so I mean, like. The people that are really just putting the effort and the time towards it are making the money. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's the key point. Um, next question: How will this change if a sixteen A sixteen Z begins to fire CEOs because they are not performing well? Will this increase, decrease, or have no effect on the number of potential deals A sixteen Z sees compared to the competition? We kind of touched on this earlier. I think it sounds like we'd say like deep, it would almost uh, it it would increase the effect they would have on number of potential deals. Yeah. Yes, um, because if the specific company A sixteen Z was going to hire uh, fire someone was because was not helpful at all, so they. Because they were hiring just specific and qualified people and capable to to do what they were looking for, by just firing someone was going to increase their capacity and their potential. Because if not, by having someone which is not working and performing very well and just paying that specific person, and one part of the article says when they were talking about expending, if expending and hiring a lot of more people and getting that amount of revenue was going to be useful just to pay the extra people they were going to be hiring. I mean, we can think about this in this part because by having not very well employees performing well, that's not making any sense just to pay them and, and waste that money. I think in this case, this will have their potential. Yeah. Um. So moving on, um, where were we at? Okay, right here. How does the operating team help a A16Z source pick win? Does it increase the odds of getting more high quality deal flow? If so, why does it affect A16Z's ability to pick winners? Does it actually have an impact on the odds of success for A16Z portfolio companies? If so, if not, why do you think that? Um, so I absolutely think their operating team has a big effect on like their sourcing, picking and winning. Um, like they spent time picking that operating team and having like so many people to be able to look over this and say yes, no, like, I mean, there, obviously there's some kind of strength in numbers in this. Yeah. Um, so the next question, put yourself in the shoes of Andreessen and Horowitz. You must decide whether or not to seek to double your assets under management. Vote as a group. The decision must be unanimous. Consider the following as you decide. How many portfolio companies can one general partner reasonably support? And are there any, any economies of scale in this business? Um, it's a very good question. So I found how many portfolios can one general partner reasonably support, and it said ten. It's about the limit that one person can handle. And I think at the moment, or maybe I didn't see how many they had actually at the end. I thought it was pretty quickly off. I think that it said they had like twenty three, um, but I'm not sure. How many at the end, or in 2013? 
it says by the mid 2010 they already had invested in 24 companies that's what it was and it was back in 2010 um so and i'm not sure how much they have now i mean that obviously kind of affects my decision a little bit yes but i would vote like don't know a whole lot about this but from what like i read and the little bit of research that i was doing on this um i would say that um they should try and grow um but within their industry yeah like and maybe what you were saying kevin earlier how they could maybe pick one or two or three um of these other um startups that were in their like sector were in like it but to mainly still focus on it because they were they were dominating the market right there in silicon valley um but try and see because i don't know how many like they have right now so if they only because they had i mean if they hired eight and there was the other two like co-owners or whatever and they had 10 so they could reasonably support about 100 if they had 50 60 i'd say yeah go for it but if you're already close to that 100 mark then i'd be careful i agree yeah i definitely i think they should expand within the tech area Yes, I was thinking about this when reading the article. I was reading three different investments they made. One of their investments was more and more and more. So every time they were investing, they were they were picturing they were following their business model. So if they if they know what they are doing, and and if they try their hiring, I would say that yes, they they are capable and they are ready to double their asset under management, but not like right away because they need to they did with the specific business model they have because if they just go crazy and expand and go to different markets and all of that they can get the risk credibility credibility to to convince the other different markets so i would say that yes they can do so but not like right away waiting like at least one year to gain more credibility so they can expand afterwards that's true because it was saying like um, they weren't gonna like really start seeing those that income margin for like another year or so. Mm -hmm. um, so that definitely would help a lot. Um, uh, all right, let's just do a quick summary of kind of like what we talked about and let's call it good. All right. So this was an interesting case. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that is. Um, I think basically, um, Andreessen just noticed that there was an industry, and they, he had previous knowledge of like IT startups and how well they were doing and how many were growing and how fast the industry was growing. And I think he just realized, hey, there's a big opportunity for some venture capitalism in this with all these startup companies where a lot of them are actually doing really well. So I think he just noticed that and jumped right into it. Yes, he made the research first. He knew what they were looking for. He verified why, and just thinking like him, he was able to verify why that specific market had a low rent back then. So he was thinking about improving it and he just did it. Yep. Absolutely. Um, we talked about how like the market at this time for venture venture capitalists wasn't very good. Um, Forty percent of venture capital venture venture to back companies fail, mm -hmm. and then also like only twenty percent of these companies that were backed by venture capitalists were actually making a profit. So, and then like only three to 5% of the venture capitalists were making like the big money. Right, and then you had a lot of people who are now going to um, crowdfunding sites and 
who are going to incubators like Y Combinator. Yes, the other part because they were very confident in launching the specific um, business was because they were hiring the right people already with experience and looking for three different things to be ready, capable, and also able to, to work as a team. So by hiring the right people, they were able to go confident and, and build a very, a very well structured business model, which was the pick and win, also doing a very great marketing strategy. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I agree with that. Absolutely. Um, and then what else did we talk about? Oh, they treated the, the founders right. I mean, they were yeah. taking the founders of these startups and saying, yeah, run your company. They, they looked at those super successful businesses like Apple, Microsoft, um, into it, uh, all these others, and we're like, oh, well, these guys were these IT guys that started up in their apartments or in like a little office building, and they ran the business, so they just figured let's let them run the business, and that worked really well for them by attracting a bunch of those other startups that wanted to maintain control. Yes, that's true, because they were having a very great structure. That is why they were able to have this investor's company very successful because by investing, going and looking, doing research and all of that, that was making them. And also, I was reading that Anderson was mentioning that if we are going to do something, if we're going to launch a business, we need to be in, we, and we have to be in, in one of the first five places. If we're going to do very well, we need to be in one of the first five places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, also talking about like the um, their operating team. Obviously, they had a very capable operating team to find those startups that were actually going to produce something and obviously like they they had backgrounds in IT they were able to evaluate these guys as startups and really decide whether they wanted to invest in these or not and a lot of them they did really good like i think they said they invested in Skype and that came out really good for them so mm -hmm. So overall, um, I think we decided that they should try and double their assets under their management um, and maintain most and like maintain their control in like the IT sector of this industry, right? Right. Yeah. So, and then I guess one of the other decisions too was what do they do geographically? And because um, it says yeah, that's the right. The move. And I think they should actually if they stay in tech. They should stay in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Yes, because that's the market and the target yeah. market. They have credibility because if Andre was mentioned to go to New York or China, on those places there may be already some other business just like theirs. But they need to gain more credibility so they can go ahead and launch their business in those places. Right. Yeah. So. I think that pretty much covers it, I guess. All right. Sounds good. Cool. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. And I'll send the link over again. All right. Thank you. Okay. Have a good one. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, have a good night. Enjoy conference. You too. Bye-bye. See you.